Hi folks, I've got another rambly video for you today. This is about a topic which I have seen a significant amount of discussion on around and about on the internet, specifically YouTube, but elsewhere. And in fact, I've even had a few conversations about this uh, offline. The idea of is social media good or bad for us? And is it good or bad for, for wider society? And I'd like to just have a bit of a, a bit of a discussion about this. I know I've talked about it, talked about it on this channel before, um, but this video has sort of been inspired by a few others. Um, I don't know, you, many of you guys who uh, watch this channel also watch Brian Lunduk's channel and uh, he's put out a couple of videos. The first outlining that social media is faulty by design and the second talking about how he's actually removing himself from the social media ecosystem. And um, he raised some really interesting points actually, specifically in the video where he talks about how social media is defective by design. And I'd like to explore some of the ideas that he mentions there. Um, specifically the idea of now, when we say social media, social media requires a significant amount of definition because when we talk about social media, there are some things that immediately come to mind. Facebook, Twitter, maybe things like Snapchat and Instagram. But then do we count other things like, for example, uh, Discord? Now, I suppose I do count Discord as social media. It works in a significantly different way. But you do see a lot of YouTubers and, and, and um, people of similar standing have Discord rooms, which sort of act as more casual forums to discuss. Now, this channel did have a Discord slash Riot room that was bridged, and uh, it was actually quite, pop quite popular and very active, but I did actually decide to close it down for a few reasons. One, that it was actually a time sink. I actually found myself waking up in the morning and actually having to uh, clock, you know, check in with everyone. Lots of people were asking questions, and, and it just took so much time out of my day that was getting taken away from making videos, doing live streams, all that kind of stuff. But also because I felt that the overall structure of the system, the style of the chat room system, was very inward looking. And this channel is not about inward looking kind of stuff. Like the last thing I want to do is is um, is have an audience that, shall we say, is, is loyal to me. Now, I know a lot of YouTubers uh, try and foster that kind of audience. Uh, and you can look at the obvious, you know, Jake Paul, Logan Paul kind of um, way where they try and cultify their audience so that they can effectively sell them t-shirts with rather, you know, just logos and stuff on them, which as far as I can see is is really just not, not something that I personally want to indulge in and, and have any kind of part in because, you know, I, I'm not a t-shirt salesman. I'm not here to peddle crap that you don't need. Um, but also, you know, it, yeah, it's like this channel, when I when I decided to, to put work into the open source side of it, to put stuff into the Linux side of it, I wanted to signal boost things. I wanted to, you know, when I discovered a great new application or a great new like open source game or even just a, a great new game in general, that I wanted to show as many people as possible, especially when it comes to like the open source projects that just don't get enough attention. Um, and there are, even when I uh, hang out on Mastodon, there are countless people who are looking for a, a particular application or a, to do a particular job. And, and I can think of the perfect one, um, but it just doesn't get the exposure in the open source world, partly because um, people in open source uh, tend to be very mechanically minded, I guess is the word I'm looking for, or engine, you know, like we have that sort of engineer mentality um, over, should we say, the marketing kind of mentality. We don't have too many marketers. We don't have, you know, we're not big fans of the cheap buzzword culture that you get in, for example, in, 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 in larger tech industries, like, for example, with, with Apple and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we are, you know, we are more sub we are a more substantive community. And I think that's what attracts us to uh, open source and, and, and attracts us to, to Linux in general. So I wanted to remedy that. I wanted to be like, okay, well, there's plenty of incredibly intelligent people in the Linux and open source community, but um, it's, it, you know, it's all well and good having the best operating system and the best apps to run on it, but what if no one knows about it, you know? So that's really what I wanted to do. And I felt that inward looking social media networks were, um, were running contrary to that particular, you know, I want to be open. I want to be out there as, as much as possible. So it did make sense to a degree that um, the, the platforms that were more open facing like Twitter might be something that I, I could uh, make better use of when it comes to, uh, you know, sort of uh, promoting the values of this particular channel. Now, um, I don't like Twitter for a number of reasons. And I think the reason I don't like it now is because it's become too much of a stage, too much of a platform where um, you put out anything and it's critically analyzed um, 
with so much more thought than you initially put into it. I remember the days, right? Here's my dinosaur Chris is coming out. Early days of Facebook. And when it was a status update, I remember me and my, and my housemate Liam at the time, we were just putting silly statuses like, uh, you know, Chris Ware is farting around on Facebook like a lunatic and all that kind of stuff. You, could, you know, like the idea that we were posting silly shit like that on, on things like Facebook and Twitter nowadays just doesn't seem, it seems like it's so much more of a formal platform and that the fun has just been sapped out of it. Um, and, and further to this as well, and you hear this on Twitter, and I've even started hearing this on other social platforms like Discord as well. I need it for work or I need to use it. Need. The word there, need, right? Now, maybe this is me being a jackass, but when anyone ever says they need something like a social media platform, that to me screams addict. I need another drink. I just need another cigarette. I'll be all right after that. What You know, it's, it's the addiction side of things. I'm starting to see similarities between social media, wider social media, and, and things like smoking. And I have no doubt, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that if we carry on this trajectory, especially with Twitter and Facebook, that social media will eventually be seen as the cigarettes of mental health. And I think that um, uh, we, we can pot potentially curtail it, we could learn to adapt so that it doesn't harm us as much. But I, I certainly feel that the amount of frustration and stress that social media has caused me in the past um, well, it certainly isn't something that I would recommend uh, other people to, to adopt and carry on. So this idea that we need social media. Uh, so not only do I take exception to it because it, uh, it, it sounds like an excuse, right? I, I, we survived many, 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 many centuries without social media. So the idea that we need it now to me seems just a little bit ludicrous. And, you know, I live in a very traditional town full of very traditional people. So maybe I'm a step or two behind the times on, on, on a few things these days, well, which is fine. I can accept that. But the idea that we need social media just makes me want to vomit. It genuinely does. The idea that we need companies like Twitter and we need companies like Facebook, that we need people like Mark fucking Zuckerberg. No, we don't. We don't. We need friends and family. We need a roof over our head. We need steady incomes and, you know, reliable transport links, clean water. Those are things we need. We don't need fucking Twitter. We don't need fucking Facebook. We don't need Discord. And it's remarkable. And I was looking around. I was doing a bit of very light research. When I say light research, I mean looking through broadsheet newspapers and all that kind of stuff. So don't take that. Don't take this as any kind of scientific consensus. But it seems that at March of this year, 2018, that we hit peak social media, that the larger social media platforms started to seriously go in, into decline there. And then I sort of realized, well, I deleted Facebook. So maybe, maybe, maybe it's not that startling after all. And I'll tell you what, not once did I want to go back. Not, not one single time. When I was on Facebook, I often felt compelled to check in with various groups, check in with various people, check in, you know, all this kind of stuff. That went away. Part of it went away because a lot of my friends followed me over to Twitter. Uh, they were only attached to Facebook because I was. So um, maybe that there is a responsibility of people who can actually have the, the, the social clout to actually move a few people over. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm not big on social media by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, Brian Lunduke in his video says that he isn't really that big on social media and he's a lot bigger than I am and a lot more well-connected than, than I am. So um, it might even be something of a guide or a um, or a look to the future that if I were to get to the size of Brian Lunduke, I would then experience some of the same problems that Brian would have because I think a lot of these problems are systemic. You can't point to an individual person and say, you know, it, it's their fault. I mean, as, as, as much as it, as cathartic as it feels to blame Mark Zuckerberg for all of these problems I'm talking about today, it's not his fault. It's not. He probably wasn't even the first person to come up with such a design for Facebook. I mean, there was MySpace before him. There were forums before him as well. But... Um, but he was the one that supercharged it, and, and maybe it was his business mind that made Facebook what it was, rather than his um, his his, his uh, attitude as a software developer. So when it comes to looking at things from a systemic standpoint, rather than an individual standpoint, uh, there's a, a great concept called just culture, and um, I believe it exists within the aviation industry. The idea that if something goes wrong, 
to never attribute blame to anyone, but rather focus on fixing the problem and making sure that it doesn't happen again. And there's a very specific reason why uh, this is employed in, in the aviation industry. And that's because you want to incentivize people to come forward with problems as soon as possible. And you are disincentivizing people from coming forward with problems with mistakes if they're going to get punished for it. It's much more comfortable then to ignore a mistake or cover it up so that you get to keep your job, so that you get to stay out of trouble. But then again, the problem persists. And well, if it's a safety problem at hand, you really don't want that happening in the aviation industry. So it makes a lot more sense. And I think that this is an idea that we should expand outwards, the idea of a just culture, that when we see a problem, don't blame group A, don't blame group B, don't blame any single person, don't, you know, in fact, don't, don't even worry about blame, right? It feels great, and I think that's why people do it. Trust me, having a, you know, I could make this a video, an entire rant against Mark Zuckerberg, and it would feel wonderful, and I'm sure many of you guys would agree with me, and you'd click that like button and all that kind of stuff, but it wouldn't be constructive, it wouldn't be right, right? It wouldn't be correct, it wouldn't be pragmatically correct. And I think this is where we need to go now with, with, with social media. We need to look at, at how we can build on it, how we can improve on it. So as you guys know, I'm, I, I'm on Mastodon, which is a very similar, um, uh, it's a very similar platform to Twitter. Um, now, uh, Eugen, uh, otherwise known as Gargron, who is the, uh, I guess we could call him the chief engineer behind all, all of this, has made some, some decisions about Mastodon to try and not make it like Twitter. And I think some of these are, are quite uh, interesting. The primary one being that he doesn't allow quote tweeting. So I don't know if you know what quote tweeting is or tweet quoting. I can't remember which way around it goes, uh, which is basically where, you know, when you click the reblog, uh, retweet button on Twitter and, it, and it, then it puts the tweet that you're retweeting in the um, in a little card and then you can add your comment to it. Um, and what this does is that it allows celebrities to uh, take um, a, a tweet from someone who might not be a celebrity to lift it up, publicize it, and then make fun of it. So you're lifting someone up for the sole purpose, or you're lifting up something that someone said for the sole purpose of tearing it down, which just seems like a real dickhead move, doesn't it? It just really does. Like, it's, it's what bullies do. Uh, and I think that a lot of Twitter and a lot of social media, it facilitates bullies. It really does. It gives them a platform. It gives them power. Um, and the idea that this doesn't actually happen in, in, in Mastodon, it's an interesting step. And I think that it's a step in the right direction. Now, that's not to say Mastodon and the Fediverse doesn't have bullies. It's not to say that it doesn't have its, its jackasses and all that kind of thing. And the fact of the matter is every platform is because jackasses exist in the world. And, um, and I, you know, you can have a separate discussion as to how exclusory, exclusory, how much you want to exclude these people. But at the end of the day, their you know their jackasses exist. We have to work around it. Now we can we can um, you know not uh, enable tools, or we can we can you know we cannot build tools that enable bullies, um, and we can use and uh, support platforms that actually think about these kind of implementations as well. Now I know that there's a lot of discussion and a lot of disagreement to and fro uh, on on whether or not these kind of uh, policies are beneficial and which ones are and which ones aren't. Um, and these are very important discussions to uh, to have as well. But in Mastodon, I see some of the uh, some similar issues as well. Now I've got um, a significant number of followers, in my opinion. But then may, then again, maybe my bar's a little bit lower. I think I've got seventeen hundred followers on uh, on Mastodon, uh, which is uh, more than I ever had on Twitter, I think. And they're engaged, you know, and, and I love chatting with you guys on Mastodon. It's one of my favorite platforms. And, and I'm not going to be leaving that one anytime soon. But something that Brian Lunduk said that, that, that really kind of landed with me when he was outlining how social media is defective by design is that the bigger you are, the more these problems compound. And, and even sometimes when I post something on, on Mastodon that's a bit of a joke, um, it's not unusual for someone to sort of correct it, not realizing it's a joke. And boy, does that like that, that just like ah, joke didn't land, you know? Um, and, and, and at the moment, like that's just a minor frustration, a minor irritation, but I can see that evolving into a situation where you can't post anything on social media without it being so critically analyzed, critically analyzed, where people, you know, like deliberately finding fault in just about everything you say. And I do see that uh, with a lot of people that say anything that could be mildly disagreeable is then compounded into you're suddenly the devil. Um, because 
uh, partly to do with maybe mob mentality. Now, when I was studying psychology at school, and, and again, don't take anything I say about this too seriously, I actually failed psychology, so I'm not uh, what's the opposite of an expert? Someone that's like actually tried to learn something and then realized, mm, not for me. Um, but one of the things that absolutely fascinated me about psychology is the idea of mob mentality. And again, this comes back to things like just cultures and uh, not blaming individuals for the actions of systemic problems um, because it's it's just a mismatch. It really is because um, if you look at the, the psychology of mobs, they usually are a reduction to the base animal instincts that we have because you can't control mobs they're they're they they're, it's not even they're self they're rudderless uh is effectively what they are and um uh, so um so you know you see it like when riots happen and i think that some of those principles can can be mirrored over on on social media where you're not actually at that point assessing or deconstructing or even amicably disagreeing with someone you're you're just going after them with a mob and that kind of might feel really 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 good and it might feel justified and it might feel like your viewpoints are vindicated but then um does it actually you know persuade the other person i don't know anyone who has been uh seriously persuaded i know people who have been um chased off um, and I know, you know, so I, I, it's not a great platform for open discussion from that point of view. Um, now, I think Facebook probably has other kind of problems as well. In fact, Facebook very well might compound the worst of Twitter with the worst of Discord because you kind of have the inward looking stuff of Facebook friends and the outward looking stuff of, of Facebook pages. Now, I'm not on Facebook, haven't been on for years, so I'm not going to comment too much on that. But um but the fact that so many people seem to be getting rid of Facebook is 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 telling there and then. Um, and I've also noticed quite a few uh, fellow YouTubers. I think uh, Hex DSL. Uh, I think the folks over at User Error um, uh, uh, from uh, Jupiter Broadcasting, and I think uh, Gardner, the Linux gamer. They've all set up forums. They've all set up forums lately, and I think that's pretty cool. I'm sure there are others that I'm missing out now. Um, oh, didn't Spatry have a... He's got a forum as well, isn't it? Cup of Linux kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, and I like that. I really quite like that. And the thing I like about forums is that at least the, the good forum software actually gives you an RSS feed so you don't actually have to keep visiting all these forums. You just subscribe to the RSS feed. I've got a little... Um, I've got a little folder on my Liferia RSS client of forums, and uh, and I can see and I can check in with all these different Linux forums to see uh, what people are uh, saying. I don't post too much on forums, truth be told. Maybe I should, um, but um, but that's a genuinely good type of of, of uh, decentralization of of social networks, and I think that's what you know, because because I think Reddit is also part of a problem here. Reddit is is brings to itself some other systemic problems. Largely, uh, Reddit defines truth by popular opinion, and I I detest that with every fibre of my being. And maybe that's my university education sort of overarching here. But um, yeah, just just you know, like uh, uh, Reddit seeks to democratise public opinion and public discourse so that um, the most popular voices are the most prominent. And I think that that is uh, a problem. Now, in, in Reddit, you can sort other things, you know, in order of time and all that kind of stuff. But it, I think it does default to uh, hot hotness is the term, uh, which is effectively a cross between new and uh, popular. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I, I often want to compare popular, you know, conventional opinion, conventional wisdom to... Um, alternatives as well because um, it's important to see you know like when you when you compare a, a you know a, a viewpoint sometimes you realize that there is a reason why conventional wisdom is the way that it is and sometimes you can find good reason to challenge conventional conventional wisdom and I think reddit kind of hinders that in a lot of ways um, and I think with reddit as well you also because it's divided into communities you can uh, to a degree have that inward looking um, uh, type of culture as well. Not as much, not to the extent of Discord, but again, it, it presents itself with some systemic problems. Um, so I think that I've, I've largely covered some of the, what I believe to be some of the problems with social media that are, are guilty by design, but not the biggest, well, I, I sort of glanced uh, past it earlier, which is that they're addictive by design. Uh, there's no point in 
Twitter if people don't visit the website. Uh, and the way to make people visit the website is to make people feel compelled to visit the website. And maybe it's the dopamine rush of getting some likes and retweets. Maybe it's the promise of popularity. And I, I find that social media platforms often sell you a lot of promises. It's like, you you need Twitter for work because one day you might be super famous and have tens of thousands of, of subscribers and, uh, and, and then you need a way to talk to them all and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, or one of these days you might be really, really important and you might have to say stuff that goes on public record and Twitter is a great place where your public record is actually read by lots of people. Um, but it's all promises, isn't it? How many of those promises came true for how many people? Uh, so, yeah, it's addictive by design. And um, and I think that we do need to, to look at that. Now, um, in again, going back to Mastodon, there are things like... Um, uh, it started to hide the number of likes and retweets a post has unless you actually click further into the post, I believe. And I think that's quite good as well, so that you don't immediately spot something and go, ooh, that's popular. Everything gets an equal footing as well, which I, I, I genuinely uh, quite like. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the videos that this has been inspired by, there have been a couple. Uh, it's not only Brian Lundukes, but the latest podcast, User Error, um, which is quite a nice little podcast. Um, and I uh, you know, recommend you guys check it out. It's one of the Jupiter Broadcasting uh, ones. And they talk you know, more about the broader topics, often around tech and lifestyle tech and all that kind of stuff. Joe Ressington makes what I would consider one of the best possible arguments for social media. Uh, he says that it helped him uh, get into his work as being a professional podcaster, as well as helping him meet his wife, which um, undeniably pretty amazing things. And uh, I got to say, those are arguments that I did actually identify with quite strongly. I live in a somewhat rural community. And as, as much as I absolutely love living here, uh, there are, uh, you know, it, it's um, for a young person who's interested in open source technology. There aren't that many people around here who who have that interest, who I have that in common with. And that's a really you know important part of, of my life. So the Internet and social media has actually allowed me to connect with a lot of people who I wouldn't usually be able to connect with. And it's helped me expand my knowledge base and uh, it's helped me expand, um, you know, like it's helped me meet people who who I wouldn't otherwise have met, who have actually provided me with an absolutely, you know, amazing relationships in, in, in life. So, um, yeah, I, I absolutely have to agree with the points that he makes there. Um, and this is why I don't think it's necessarily worth throwing all social media out of the window. Uh, and again, this is all comes down to what we define as social media. Do forums count as social media? Does email count as social media? Do email lists count as social media, even sometimes when they, they function in a, in a very similar way. And, um, you know, these are questions that I, I'm not in any way capable of answering in this specific video, but maybe over the years we can, uh, amongst ourselves, sort of discuss it and work it all out. But, um, but then again, uh, when it comes to social media, it very much does allow you to pick and choose your friends very, very, very easily, arguably too easily. See, one of the benefits of living in a community where... Um, I have a, a significant amount in common with most people because of the fact that we are just in a reasonably small community. But um, I also have a significant number of differences that um, that constantly challenge a lot of my, uh, you know, my perspectives on, on the world. And I think that that's great because, you know, what are ideas if they're not battle tested um, or at least, you know, not discussed and not raised and not challenged? So uh, it's pretty great to actually be able to to work with people that, you know, might be a little bit more conservative than me. But then again, you know, it teaches us to build on common ground, something which I think that a lot of social media uh, actually discourages us from doing it. It encourages us to find like minded people and then just follow, you know, uh, a, a uh, follow us into an echo chamber at, at times as well. Um, whereas, yeah, in my day to day life, uh, I experience people who who love Macs because they're so easy to use and, um, you know, Mac OS and then the Mac computer and, and the whole ecosystem there has actually helped uh, a lot, you know, a rather large number of elderly people get into computers where otherwise they might really have struggled to do so. And honestly, I don't see them uh, succeeding 
with Linux in that particular situation there in a lot of cases. So, you know, this is one of the reasons why I say that it's always important to be quite critical of who you encourage uh, to use Linux, because there are some people who uh, who it really doesn't suit their existing skill set. And maybe some of these people, not to be too ageist here, but might be a little bit old to learn a whole new skill set be- just to keep up with the grandchildren or just to check their email or just to do some very mundane day to day things. So, um, again, you know, this is one of these ideas that has actually been very much challenged is trying to talk about Linux and open source with people that have no idea what it is. And this is something that uh, stepping away from social media has really benefited me uh, from doing. And again, it's important to say that this is not a dichotomy. We're not choosing between the real world and social media. This is very much finding a way to live with all of these forces in our life. And I think that that is something that is significantly more complicated. It's not as easy as telling a person that they can lose all the weight they need to by just stopping eating altogether. Um, You know, life and the world just doesn't work like that. So... um, so yeah, I think Joe uh, Joe Ressington actually does make a really good case, and he probably makes uh, the, the strongest case of not throwing everything out all in in one go, but rather to take a very critical eye in how we use it, how we approach it, and even the services that we use. Again, a lot of this is is like, what is social media? Is it forums? Is it email lists? For example, is it chat rooms? Is it IRC? Can IRC be considered a social network? I would actually argue so much as to say yes, and I believe. Uh, IRC was officially released in 1988, so it even predates the World Wide Web, which is something that's quite fascinating. IRC, the original social network. I, I, I would say that IRC is it's every bit as much of a social network as Discord, um, wouldn't you say? I don't know. That's just my thoughts, and I think everyone has their own definition of what a social network is. Uh, mine is quite expansive, mine is quite inclusive, but some people just mean Facebook, Twitter, uh, the whole Web 2.0 stuff. Um, but I say it goes back, you know, like I say, it could even predate World, World Wide Web number one. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I'd be interested to hear your guys' thoughts on this, so please do leave them down in the comments section below. Uh, that being said, this is something that we've talked about plenty of times on this channel before. Um, but like I said, I think the biggest reason is that it is, um, it's addictive by design, um, and it suffers with it the same kind of problems. But because it is something that largely affects mental health, it's something that's so much more convenient and easy to sweep under the rug to ignore about it. And um, I think, in, you know, in, in a wider uh, sense, uh, you know, we don't pay attention to our mental health the same way that we do pay attention to our physical health. Um, and largely, maybe that's because, well, you put on a few pounds, it's, it's visible. It's there, and you might, might be worried about other people judging you, or you might be worried about the pressure that that puts on your heart. Or maybe you might start wheezing when you get to the top of the stairs, you know, and, um, and that's, you know, potentially a cause for concern. But is it that obvious when it comes to mental health? No, because it's so easy to rationalise just about anything in our own heads, isn't it? It's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? We're killing ourselves, uh, you know, mentally with things like Twitter and Facebook and what have you. Um, and... Um, and, it, and it's just so easy to explain it away as something that we need, as a necessary evil. Wow, as a, ne- as a necessary evil. And that's something that I just can't, I can't accept, I guess. So, um, so I think that's largely about what I've got to say. There are quite a few other things that I could possibly tag on to this video, but I think I might leave them for, uh, for another time. Um, so that's about it from me today. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you're interested in the audio-only version of a lot of these videos, you can find them over on my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash chrisware. Everything on my Patreon is fully public. I don't put anything behind a paywall, um, and you don't have to be a, a Patreon subscriber, or I don't even believe you actually even have to have a Patreon account whatsoever to actually access uh, these uh, as MP3, uh, MP3 files, and I do believe you can download them as well. So uh, if you are so interested in what is a pseudo-podcast, I guess, um, then uh, feel free to uh, check that out. And also, uh, I've got a gaming channel which I've been having lots of fun with. We play, we've been playing the new Hitman 2 through Steam Play, which is um, it's a lot of fun and it runs really quite well. Also, just a correction to my last uh, last but one video on the Hitman 2 um, and the Hitman 2 game. I said that a lot of people I know were having problems with AMD cards, and there were a number of people in the comments that were saying, "Ah, but I've got an AMD card and it works perfectly." So. Um, so I think that that is worthy of note, perhaps worth checking Steam DB. And if you guys happen to be one of those people with an AMD card that works with Hitman 2, um, it, you go over to Proton DB and, uh, and let people know. It's, um, it would be very useful information. So thank you very much for joining me. That's about it from me today. And um, yeah, until next time, I've been Chris Ware and you've been awesome. Take care now.